So this demonstrates the coherence in the process. Okay, so uh, that's just a summary of the last lecture that we would do uh, uh, some wavelength preparation, resonance imaging, spin flips, but also quantum gates that really specify true unitary operations uh, in these optical analysis. Okay, so, so the, 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 the thing to note here just is, in preparation for the rest of the lecture today, is this idea that there is a difference between specifying that you want to map from a certain quantum state to a certain quantum state, and that you want to do a certain well-specified unitary evolution. And the reason for that is there are often many different unitary evolutions that will take me from a certain initial quantum state to a certain final one. That's an important lesson when you're trying to control quantum systems. Okay, so we're back to uh, uh, the topic now of qubits. Before I continue here, perhaps I should say, I should just open the floor to any questions about this uh, little extension of the last lecture. Are you all clear on this idea that I can ask an optimization program to do either state-to-state -state mapping or a full a specific unitary transformation? That makes sense. Okay. So, now, why would we want to do qubits? After all, uh, a lot of the beautiful experiments that we hear about, for example, the last two lectures, that was really, insofar as it involved spins, it was all about spin one-half particles. Of course, there's a reason for that, namely that the physics that we're trying to simulate is that of electrons in a solid, and electrons are spin one-half particles. Nevertheless, I would say, uh, if you're interested in quantum control as a science in its own right, uh, going beyond spin one-half is sort of the next step. Spin one-half in some sense is, is pretty trivial. Uh, going to larger spins give you a, a control that is not as trivial, uh, certainly, but you're still working in a finite dimensional space. Uh, and that makes things uh, somewhat easier than really hard. The other thing is the answer. Uh, if we have a D-level system, uh, there is a useful basic paradigm for that, namely we have an angular momentum that's larger than a half. That can be, any D-level system can be mapped onto that. Uh, from the point of view as uh, quantum physics, I mean, we know that atoms and molecules are usually larger, have spins larger than spin one half. But also, anytime we have a two-mode system in physics, it actually maps onto an angular momentum. I don't know uh, whether this is something that has been mentioned here. Probably not. Or has yeah, it? it has. Okay, great. Uh, right. but, but you, you may still want to repeat it. Right, yeah. I will do so. So the idea is if you have something like, for example, an Alexander interferometer, which is a device that has two modes going through the system, and there's some coupling between them, or you could have a double well potential with particles on either side. That's also a two mode system that is low water mode 2 and there's coupling between them by tunneling of particles through here, well, you can uh, take the creation and annihilation operators for particles, for photons, excitations really in these two modes, and you can put them together in these three ways and you get three new operators that have the commutation relations of an angular momentum. But if they have the commutation relations of an angular momentum, they are an angular momentum. And you can see, for example, if you look at the C component here, if we take the uh, uh, excitation value of that, you're going to get the difference between the number of excitations, say the number of photons in the two arms here. And if we look at the excitation value of these two uh, uh, operators here, observables, it will tell something about the uh, phase relationship between these two arms. So, uh, and, and of course, we can create rotations of this angular momentum. Uh, using beam splitters and phases, phases we insert in these arms, and, and similar checks can be played here. Okay, so what we can learn about controlling a large angular momentum also, in principle, applies to one of these situations here. So it's a very general thing. Quantum information science, uh, we already talked about that, uh, both in my lecture and last week in Ivan Deutsch's lectures. Many physical systems are actually 
not two-level systems, they are qubits, d-dimensional systems. Certainly that's the case for most atoms, but many superconducting devices are the same thing. Uh, very often, as we just saw, one chooses to work with some embedded qubit, but perhaps there are ways that one can take advantage of the entire qubit to, to do some things that one couldn't otherwise do. And of course, in quantum, quantum metrology, if you have a spin that's larger than spin one-half, you can start playing tricks. So just like you can produce squeezing of light, you can produce squeezing of spins. Basically, you can take a quantum uncertainty distribution of a spin, and you can reduce the uncertainty in one component relative to the other. And there's uh, quite a bit of activity right now trying to use that to make more precise clocks and interferometers and magnetometers. So there's a good number of reasons why we should think about what it takes to manipulate and control uh, spins beyond spin one half. So that's a bit of uh, motivation. And what I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about the issue of controllability in d-dimensional space. Uh, this was already discussed at some level, uh, actually at a pretty high level, in Ivan's lectures last week. But I'm going to go through it again uh, in my own language, and ho hopefully seeing it again will sort of reinforce the uh, uh, important points. So what we are going to do, uh, sort of taking our clue for, uh, from the quantum control community as a whole, is we are going to define controllability as unitary controllability. That means that the dynamics driven by some Hamiltonian can carry out any unitary transformation that you can think of in some finite, to be arbitrary large, but finite time t. And as we saw last week, you can state this formally. You can say, if we have some time-dependent Hamiltonian that can be expressed in terms of some fixed Hamiltonians, and then some uh, amplitudes in front that we can modulate in time. And just to remind ourselves of jargon, these in the field are referred to as control waveforms. Then you can plug this Hamiltonian into a Schrodinger equation. It'll evolve the state from time 0 to time t. And the transformation is a unitary operator. And this unitary operator solves a Schrodinger equation of its own with this Hamiltonian, where the boundary condition is that as time zero, you haven't involved the system yet, and the propagation operator is, of course, the, the identity. This is getting tired. Okay. <clears throat> is there another? Is the pointer in my I'm shaking it. What kind of batteries does it pay? I don't even know. It's, it's new. Actually, I have a feeling, but it may not be the battery because it seems to fade. And is it yours? Yeah. Oh, we have one. Try shaking it. Okay. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> you obviously have one of these two. Serious experiment. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, so we control, we define controllability then uh, by saying that for any unitary we can think of on this d dimensional system, there exists a set of control waveforms so that we can make that unitary after some time t. And this is something you can go back and look at in. Uh, bunch of old papers that date back quite a while. Uh, one of Ivan Deutsch's students covered this very nicely in his PhD thesis that you can find on the archive uh, in a language that I think is more accessible to atomic physicists. Yes? Is state initialization considered a part of uh, being a controllable system? No, as you can see that's nowhere here in, the, in, in this definition. You're of course right that if we want to benefit from the ability to implement control, we had better make sure that we can define the starting point. Okay. But as it's given here, that's not usually part of the definition. And you, and you can see that it would have to be something completely different anyway, because there's no unitary transformation, no kind of Hamiltonian that can start you in a state that you don't know. So a mixed state and put you in a state that you do know, so a pure state. So that would be a completely different kind of, of control. Which, and that kind of control, incidentally, people have thought about similar definitions for that kind of control. When can you do that? But that's not nearly as well studied or understood. Okay, so, a necessary and sufficient 
condition for controllability is that this set of Hamiltonians that we have access to, these guys, and there's got to be a limited number of them, are a generating set for the Lie algebra uh, in this d-dimensional space. That's, I, I, I think if you sampled at least the experimental amorphisms and asked them whether they were com comfortable with the uh, language of group theory, you would find that a very large fraction would be no more comfortable with that than with the Mandarin Chinese or something like that. Uh, so let's just try and apply a little bit of intuition to this. So the unitary transformations make up some sort of, uh, you can think of them as a kind of surface. And if we look at this equation of, of motion for the, for the unitary operator in the presence of some constant Hamiltonian, if we look at this and make an other solution for a small time step, right, then we can see that we go from u of t to u of t plus dt, we take a small step. So what happens if we have this manifold, this multidimensional surface of unitaries, and we start at time zero, here's the identity, then what one of these Hamiltonians allows us to do is to take a step in a certain direction on this surface along the tangent, and we just keep doing that. These are infinitesimal steps, of course. So if I want to get from here to here, I can in principle do it by walking along in these two directions. So if I can take steps in two directions here, I can get anywhere I want. It's sort of like I can get anywhere on the surface of the, of the Earth if I can take steps in this direction and this direction, for example, back and forth. Uh, of course, if it's a, uh, this is a two-dimensional illustration. If I add additional dimensions to this high-dimensional surfaces, I need to be able to go in more directions. But even if I go through uh, the door here, it's not enough that I can just take steps in the horizontal directions. I have to be able to go up and down, too. So what this, this Hamiltonian does is it takes a step along a tangent. And if I have a complete set of in infinitesimal steps, I'll be able to go everywhere on this multidimensional surface. If I don't have a complete step, step set, then there are places I can't go. So what do we do if the set is not complete? And what does it mean that it's not complete? Uh, what that means in a simple language is that these Hamiltonians, if they're not complete, they don't form a basis in d by d matrix space. If they form a basis, then I can make any, then by, by a linear combination of these guys, I can make up any Hamiltonian I want, and I can go anywhere I want. So that's my, that's our problem, uh, if we have one, is these guys don't form a basis. So one can try to simulate additional ones, uh, and one uses trotus form. But the idea is that you take these two Hamiltonians here and you go sort of back and forth with them in, on a closed loop like this. And uh, mathematically, uh, we can see that this is this is equal. This is a series of steps is equal to a single step taken by a Hamiltonian that's equal to the combination of them. The example that we heard last week is if you're putting together rotations, you can trace out a little square on the sphere, but this, this, the, that, that, that a series of steps doesn't quite close. If you do rotations around x and y, back and forth, back and forth, you end up with a rotation around z. Right? So that's how you can generate from two Hamiltonians, you can generate a new one. So we just have to do this until we've generated enough new Hamiltonians to have a complete set. So we have kind of a, a recipe, which is completely general. Okay, so no matter which system you're thinking about controlling, if you're asking yourself, how can or can I, in principle, do anything I want with this system, with the sort of the knobs I have to turn on my, my driving fields, as these guys here, can I do everything I want? This is what you have to do. You start out, with this set, you make an orthogonal basis. We have just to remember that these matrices form a vector space with an inner you know, scalar product defined like this. So we can use Graham Smith orthogonalization to make ourselves a, a set. And we don't do all of this on a computer, of course. And then you compute all of the commutators and see if you get new uh, operators that have a component that's orthogonal to the original ones. If so, you've got a new one, so you add it up here, you orthogonalize again, and you keep going until your basis of Hamiltonians is d-dimensional. You can do that. In principle, your system is controllable. 
If you cannot, then the system is not controllable. And then you have to return to the drawing board and see if you can find some other way, some other handles on this system. Maybe some, you have to add something else to your series of Hamiltonians up here. Okay, so it's, it's actually a fairly simple uh, process once you, you, you try to go through the steps. But it tells you something really important about your system. So here's an example. Control of that J equals something larger than a half atomic spin. The easy part is to put it in a magnetic field because there's usually a magnetic moment going along with the angle of momentum, and then you get a lot more precession right, by some angle of theta around the magnetic field, and that's just the geometric rotation. Quantum mechanically, your, your Hamiltonian, that's this form here, where we said the field is along the unit axis u. Right, so here we generate, or unitary is that geometric rotation uh, by some angle of theta, and the state uh, is evolved from initial spin state to some final spin state. And of course, these rotations are not enough. And we can, can see that very simply, because if we think about it, if I take my large spin and start it in a state of maximum projection around the z-axis, well, by geometric rotation, I can turn, say, up along z into up along x. Fine. Then. So I can go into up along any direction, but no rotation can turn up along z into a state with zero projection along. Those two states are not connected by geometric rotation. So uh, clearly rotations are not enough. And in the language of group theory, as we saw last week, the way we say it is if I take two of these operators and try to do commutators, I just get the third component of angular momentum, and that's it. The algebra closes, and this is, this is not enough operators to form a basis in an operator space. So that's not enough. And as we did last week, what is sufficient in principle, we just have to add to our Lama precession term here. The simplest thing we can imagine, just something that's proportional to one of the components of the angular momentum squared. This is like a nonlinear rotation. Right? It's a rotation on x by an amount that's proportional to the x component. And if we do that, then when I take commutators, uh, basically, a commutator like this, I get something, take a commutator again with j squared, I get something now that has three powers of j, and so on. The algebra now closes, and I can make up uh, li enough linearly independent Hamiltonians to span the matrix space of any angular momentum, no matter how large it is. For me, that's sort of a rabbit out of the hat kind of thing. I find it quite amazing that this simple, uh, this simple thing simple addition here is enough to allow me to control anything beyond spin one half, no matter how large it is. You don't have to add higher powers than that. So, great. Our system is controllable. So, well, uh, now we can start thinking about different types of problems that we can, can address. So, usually one Call this kind of thing optimal control. And I started by talking about state to state mapping, right? That was the idea, for example, of doing a spin flip. That's a, a situation where we say, I want to spin down specifically to turn into spin up, right? So we have our Ham Hamiltonian parameterized by these control waveforms, which we typically would specify a series of discrete time steps. So the control waveforms in the, term, in, in, in the end are just specified by a bunch of numbers that form a vector. And then what I want to do is I want to optimize the overlap of the initial state transform that should have been upside there. So this is a transformation of the initial state by the evolution and the state I want to get to, non-squared. Right? This is often called the fidelity. I want to optimize this. So we start from a random guess, let some computer search for the value of this vector that optimizes this function. That's very standard. Uh, actually, this is a problem that is not new. Uh, it began, as the I believe, as the coherent control problem in chemistry. And I think some, if not all, of our lecturers of ultra-fast science have uh, probably worked on this problem at some point in, in the past. I know that Phil, for example, uh, has done so. So it's actually a uh, uh, 
uh, as I said, it's not a new problem, it is one that's been uh, studied in, 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 fairly, in a fairly wide range of contexts. Uh, what's different for our atomic systems is that we really know what this Hamiltonian is. If you're trying to control a molecule with an ultra-fast laser, you don't always know what the Hamiltonian is or what the dynamics does, and you have to construct also the clever uh, algorithms that sort of learn themselves uh, uh, how to modulate the control fields. Anyway, if you know your Hamiltonian, there's an important result that says that the search landscape, that is the success of reaching the final state, as a function of these various control variables, is very benign because there are no suboptimal local maxima. So if you just pick some random place to start and use a gradient ascent algorithm, you're going to end somewhere good. So uh, that, that means that, that these computer searches are really easy. Okay. So I just wanted to maybe make a comment on that uh -huh. last slide because, of course, I found that very exciting and enticing. Mm -hmm. And in many discussions I've had with Herschel Rabbits about that point, the, the one big caveat he always gives is that you have to have infinite bandwidth. Right. And, um, and if you have any constraints on your controls, then there are false traps. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So that's yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree. This, this is under, the, under certain assumptions, which in certain contexts can be pretty egregious. For, for example, if you know errors in your control field, you have to have infinite amount of time available. Uh, if you have decoherence in the system, this is no longer going to be true, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so, uh, uh, I was always interested in what the, what the landscape looks like if you have x amount of fractional bandwidth, and then right, and then the, the nuts off, right? Ab ab absolutely, yeah. So it turns out that in the particular kind of uh, examples that, that we have worked through, that those uh, conditions don't turn out to be limiting us in any significant way. Uh, so, so, so maybe that's one thing that sort of lends interest to doing this with atomic systems, is that you can actually operate in a regime where this seems to be uh, a reasonably valid thing to go by. But thanks for the perspective. It's good to remind everybody uh, that, of course, this doesn't play out exactly the same way on different physical platforms, even if the general principles are the same. Okay, so also as we talked about uh, just a moment ago in the context of spin flips, a state map that takes you from an initial state to a final state is not a unitary transformation. Actually, if, I think, if you think about it, I can pick this initial state as one of my basis states, the first of my basis states, okay, and then I pick some additional basis states. And in that special basis, the first column of this unitary is this vector here. Right? That's what will map that unitary, any unitary of that form will map this guy into that guy. The rest of the unitary matrix I don't care about. So if it's a 2 by 2 matrix, I care about the first column, but not the second column. If it's a d by d, I care about the first column, and there are d minus 1 columns I don't care about at all. So there are many possible unitaries that do this in general. And I think it's that freedom, in part, that makes the design of these pulses so easy and means that the computational effort of numerical optimization is reasonable, at least for, for our particular system. If we want to do unitary maps, that is, we map not a state onto a state, but some part of Hilbert space onto some part of Hilbert space. Say we map subspace H1 onto H2, unitary, so they have to have the same dimension, but this dimension is now between 2 and D for a D-dimensional system, right? So 2 is the simplest case. I specify how two orthogonal vectors get mapped onto two orthogonal vectors. I can do three orthogonal vectors onto three, I can do D orthogonal vectors onto D. It, it is, is known that these pulses are a lot harder to make. This search space that we just argued was so favorable uh, doesn't look like that when you try to design unitary maps. And actually, it, it's poorly understood how hard it is to design these things. But it's known that for, for D very large, if you try to use numerical optimization to find Hamiltonians that accomplish your unitary map, all of, all of Hilbert space onto all of Hilbert space for a large D, 
that that is a very, very difficult task. It might even be that the computational effort grows exponentially with E in some cases. Okay, so uh, that sort of establishes some conceptual background. Any questions or anything we should discuss or follow up on here? Sure. So, um, what kind of maps people use in, the, in, in quantum information processing? Is, are they mostly worried about mapping one state to another, or are there some algorithms where you want to map the larger part of your Hilbert space? To yeah, so, so, so quantum algorithms are full unitary transformations of if you have n qubits, you have a 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert space that you map onto a two-dimensional, two to the n-dimensional Hilbert space. If you are trying to, to map a state onto a state, if you know what the final state is already, why do you need to do the map? Right? So, and, and, and every quantum gate, singular two-qubit quantum gate that you put together uh, in a quantum circuit to accomplish your, your, your map, uh, the, those themselves are also unitary transformations. Uh, now, quantum algorithms, Shor's algorithm and others, they are not designed in this fashion here. They're constructed as quantum circuits because somebody has a completely different way of thinking about the problem of putting together unitary transformations uh, that involved uh, you know, analogies to the Fourier transform, for example, in, in, in Shor's case, how you do a classical Fourier transform with gates. So, uh, as a result, we don't have very many quantum algorithms. We don't know very many quantum algorithms. And it would not be feasible to design them this way. <coughs> yeah? It, it seems like if you were to add more control Hamiltonians, the, the circuit problem would get easier, right? Because like if you're restricting yourself to Jx, Jy, and Jx squared, mm -hmm. which D is very large, you might have to commute them many, many, many times to go in the optimal direction. But if you add it in more controls, then you have a better chance of just going straight the right way rather than having to zig. Right. So, so good, good, there are two good points here, actually. The first is that I think you're right. The more different kinds of control fields, if you imagine you have a D-level system, you could think about, for example, how many of these D-states can I connect directly? The more, the simpler it will be and the faster it will be to implement some sort of, some, some given unitary transformation. That's the first point. The other point is, in practice, you don't walk your way through the unitary transformations by going back and forth to get the commutator of, of two Hamiltonians and, and, and get a new one. That is more of a proof of principle. That in principle I can go there by doing this. But in practice there is some conti time continuous Hamiltonian uh, that is a lot more and a much more effective way of getting from A to B. That, does, that doesn't you know, put things together out of these infinitesimal steps. And those are the kinds of things that we find numerically with these search algorithms. Okay? Anyone else? Yeah. So do you, um, I mean, you, you, have, you haven't spoken at, at all about the actual search process. The, the search mm -hmm. process itself, that is, it's like searchability rather than the search process. So is there a standard search process? I'm not sure what you... I'm not quite sure how to answer that because I'm not sure how I understand the question, well, but I'll say, say, I can say what we do. This is, right, no, this is a question because, in, you know, the, in, the, the way optimal control theory is, is, is constructed that we use in more chemical physics problems. Mm -hmm. There's a... There's a or in, uh, if, if, if you know the Hamiltonian, which is your situation, right. the real... There, there's, a, there's a sort of a formalized, optimized search process for getting as quickly as you can in terms of computational effort mm -hmm. from the beginning to the end. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my, my question. Right. So uh, first, first of all, uh, when you start out by doing this, the easiest thing, the easiest thing to do, the, the lowest effort thing to do, is to write a subroutine in Mathematica that uses Schrodinger's equation to get you from the initial to the final state, and then you calculate this function, right, for your given control waveform, and then you just stick this into uh, 
one of the Mat MATLAB uh, optimization routines and, and, and tell it, you know, find me a maximum. And what does it do? You know what, I really have no clue. I don't know what happens inside that, uh, uh, that routine, but I know that it's not optimal. So, uh, the NR community, in particular, Naveen Kanedia and Stefan Glasser, came up with this incredibly clever way of doing this optimization problem. If you have enough bandwidth, basically the idea is that you can say that my Hamiltonian doesn't change in a time continuous way, it's piecewise constant in time, like a phase changes instantaneously from one value to another and it stays constant. Right? Then there is this, this uh, uh, very, very clever algorithm that he calls grape uh, that allows you to cut down enormously on the number of times you have to do this calculation. You're probably familiar with it. Right. And we have just started playing around with that. And yes, the, uh, the gain in the, in the computational effort, the reduction in the computational effort is, is tremendous. It's probably some high power of the, probably at least d squared, maybe more, for a d-dimensional system. So it is, it is definitely, if D becomes large, it's definitely important to pay attention to this. We have had no trouble designing these state maps for D equals 16, just using CAN routines and MATLAB. But trying to design the unitaries, we have to go to these more advanced optimization routines. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, let us try to talk through the same points here now uh, uh, for a concrete example, uh, namely uh, quantum state-to-state -state mapping in the large Hilbert space that's associated with uh, the ground state of an atom. Okay, so in our case, it's uh, 133 cesium. Conveniently, that's the alkali that has the largest spin in the hyperfine ground state. So there's actually, in this ground state, which you hopefully, you hopefully remember this atomic structure from last week, in this ground state there are 16 states available. That's equivalent to 4 qubits. So it, it's not a trivial sized Hilbert space. And perhaps you will also remember the kinds of handles we have in this system. Uh, we can put on magnetic fields. That is going to give a slalom precession within these two manifolds. It's going to act like spins the Lama process. We can put on microwave radiation resonant with one of these transitions here. So we can also couple the two manifolds. We can put on laser light that uh, is close to a resonance from one of these manifolds to some excited states. And from that, we get a light shift. And that also does interesting things. So these are the kinds of handles we can think about using. Uh, I want, and then we can do optical pumping. That was the question we had before. Do you have to think about the ability to initialize as part of the ability to do control? Of course, if you do an experiment, you have to be able to start somewhere. But so we can do optical pumping and put everything into one of these stretch states here. So uh, the first example is to try to control a single spin manifold here. So forget about the, the other one up here. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you about how is the, the, the lines of the laser relative to any possible zen and shift of the levels in the, let's say, the, the f equals 3? Like, are you able to individually shift a particular m sub f state, or is it that they're all shifting together? Or? Okay, so, uh, yeah, we are going to eventually going to put bias fields on here, but uh, so, so there's going to be some splitting here. Uh, not in the first example, actually. But the idea is that. This uh, laser here is very far off resonance. This, this the tuning up here might be hundreds of line widths. And, and uh, you know, that's going to be far, far, far bigger by two or three orders of magnitude than any splittings we might have down here. So we're not, we not going to be able to go in and put significantly different light shifts on these guys here, except by taking advantage of the polarization of the laser field. So that's exactly what I was going to get to. Uh, namely that we know that it's not enough to start Lama processing this spin 
in a magnetic field, we have to put on some sort of nonlinear term, like fx squared, we know from our analysis of, uh, analysis of controllability that's the simplest thing we can do, right? And there are some options for getting this. One is simply to put on a large enough bias field that you get a nonlinear Zeeman effect, but that's kind of hard to control actually because you need a pretty large field in, in cesium because the hyperfine splitting is so large. So the other option is to use light. And so uh, Ivan, in his first lecture last week, talked about this idea that when you shine laser light on it, it's not tuned close to a res it's not right on a resonance, right? Then what you get is mostly a light shift, which acts like an operator in the ground state that depends on the spin. But in particular, he showed the light, the atom light interaction uh, can be split up in three terms. Perhaps you remember this, hopefully this is kind of remember this, that there are three terms. There is a term that is like a scalar, there is a term that is like a vector, so it's proportional to f, and there is a term that's like a tensor, so it has things like f squared in it. If you are just working on a manifold of, of given f, uh, which is what we're doing here, then this guy doesn't do anything. Okay? This has the same action on all the magnetic sublevels in that manifold, and the same is true of this guy here. So forget those two. Now let's put on linear polarization. Then the polarization vector is real, so something crossed with itself is zero. So this term here is zero. There is no fictitious magnetic field from the light. All, what, all that we are left with is this term here, which is the projection of the angular momentum onto the uh, uh, field vector squared. So in this case, it would be an fx squared term, which is just what we want. Okay. Now, this is, of course, this is an energy, uh, and uh, I can always write this, it turns out to be useful, I can always write this uh, in terms of some energy and then some constant. And uh, what, what we found useful is we can write this, this term in the Hamiltonian in terms of h bar times the scattering rate of photons. Okay h bar times the rate is an energy. And then there's some prefactor up front from the numerical constant that depends on the atomic structure and where I tune my laser and all that sort of stuff. Turns out this can be almost 10 in cesium, but there is a limit as to how large it can be. Okay. And if you think about this, this magnitude of this sets the rate of coherent evolution because it's driven by the Hamiltonian. It tells me how fast I can change the state coherently. This tells me, the scattering rate tells me the rate of optical pumping, which is how fast I can change the state incoherently. Okay, so I better be able to do things coherently much faster like, than, than things happen incoherently. So this should be fast. Or this, this constant here in the front should be large. And something like 10 is enough to do interesting things, but it's, it's certainly not ideal. And, and unfortunately, for a given atom, you, you, this is about as large as you can get it in alkalis. So this is, is not a perfect situation, but we can, we can do some things with it. So I can also show you this slide here, I believe. Uh, this is an experiment we actually do. We have magnetic field calls. We can put on a magnetic field, we vary it in time by rotating it in the xy plane. So our Hamilton, that part of our Hamiltonian, the Lama part, is parameterized by this angle. Right? And then there's a light beam that comes through and just gives us this constant part. And then what we do is we, our control waveform is specified by the value of the angle at certain times. Uh, and uh, we just put that into uh, our uh, computer program. Uh, we want to make this state, this particular waveform makes this state here. Uh, but we can uh, do some iterations and uh, try to optimize. And what we see is that the computer program, after just a few iterations, we'll find a control waveform that makes the final state very well. So, uh, uh, yeah, so in, in this case, it clearly works quite well. It's also instructive, and I think you also saw this slide, to see how the state is actually transformed by this waveform. Okay, so we start with a state that's spin up along the y direction. This is here represented by one of these uh, so-called spherical Wigner functions. It's like a probability distribution 
of directions of the spin, right? And if we if we turn the interaction on, we can see that initially we're just stretching this distribution. That's the action of this guy up here. Then it wraps around the front and back of the sphere, and the two ends interferes, and that interference is what we can steer. Uh, at this point, we have all sorts of interferences in this uh, in this uh, quantum probability distribution, this Wigner distribution, but we get to the target state. So those are definitely the kinds of control science that you can do in these atomic systems that you would not have a chance of doing, I believe, in your molecular, uh, new molecular systems. Just to remind you that we are doing experiments, some of you saw this experiment uh, on your lab visit yesterday, uh, and uh, really uh, the most central part of this experiment is to get in a more like control of your magnetic fields so that uh, uh, you don't run into limits with bandwidths of the accuracy with which you can apply the fields, etc. And here are some examples of target states we uh, ask the computer to, sign, to design waveforms to make. We can model what we should get out. We can also run the experiment. And uh, we can use one of these algorithms or schemes for quantum state reconstruction that I even told you about I believe Wednesday uh, last week. Uh, I don't want to get into that at all, but there are ways of doing quantum state tomography and measure the entire density matrices. Once you do that, you can, of course, easily calculate the overlap between these two and back out the fidelities. And they are not super good. They're about 0.9 here. And, and more generally, if you make a histogram uh, for doing many different states, each of them with many different waveforms, uh, you can make a histogram. And again, it's not great. We had a problem with some outliers showing up that turned out to be just geometrically rotated versions of the state you wanted to, to, to make. If you correct it for that, the fidelities got a bit higher. Uh, state tomography itself has limited fidelity, uh, in our case about 90%. So the apparent fidelities are probably about 10% lower than they really are. So you can see we can probably make a final state with a success rate of about 90%. That's definitely not good enough if you want to, to do uh, quantum information processing. Yeah? Uh, in terms of the fidelity of the state tomography. So that there's a nice chicken and egg uh, question there, right? So the way you find out which state you've made is you do tomography. The way you find out whether your tomography works is that you put in a known state and see what comes out. So in, in, in this particular case, there were a small subset of states that we thought we could make with really good fidelity, like states that would spin up in some direction, for example, or simple varieties thereof. And we kind of used that to test it. The second example I will show you, we will actually, we got around that problem. We, we managed to determine fidelity without doing tomography. So I'll show you how that can be done. Okay, so this is our, this is our first uh, demo, uh, and uh, it turned out this worked well enough to do interesting things. Uh, if I had had another lecture, I could have told you about how to use this to uh, play around with things like quantum chaos, but we won't have time for that. The, the, the real lesson for us here was that we had enough problems with magnetic field errors and also in the homogeneity of our laser beam that made this light shift that the fidelity was much less than we had. I mean, 90%, what do you need for, for quantum computation? You need errors of 10 to minus 4. Right? So there, there's quite a ways to go there. So, of course, I spent the first lecture talking a lot about this idea of robust control. Right? If we have uh, magnetic fields that aren't quite what we thought they should be, or light shifts that aren't quite what we thought they should be, maybe we can use these composite pulse tricks to correct for that and get around that. Well, as we saw for the qubits, these composite pulses take longer. And if you have problems with decoherence ticking in the background, the fact that they take longer means that you don't necessarily win. And that was actually the case here. We have, we have too much light scattering here. The separation between coherent and incoherent timescales was only less than 10. So back to the drawing board. Did I see a question? Is that? No. Okay, so in this situation, right, the problem is it just doesn't admit of any of these clever tricks. 
And then, yeah, we really have to start over. Go back to our cesium atom and say, okay, using this certainly wasn't a good idea, right? Because photons gather in Omega, it turned out to be limiting. Yeah? So, Gamma S, was it the lifetime of the exact state? Uh, the lifetime of the excited state in cesium is, what is it? The line is about 5 megahertz. I think so it works out for about 30 nanoseconds. So, in the Hamiltonian, you use Gamma S. Is that the spontaneous energy? Uh, that is the scattering rate. Scattering. So that's the, it, you know, for a, a far attuned laser field, the population up here is very small, right? And the rate of scattering from a single atom is the population up here times the decay rate of that state. So the scattering rates were pretty tiny. They were a few hundred hertz, which means that the coherence times were many milliseconds. Okay. But in any case, uh, we have to get rid of this light. Oops. So let's get rid of it and look at just the ground state manifold. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Ivan argued last week, if we allow ourselves Lama precession and this kind of coupling here, we can actually, it turns out, still control the system. If we don't have light on, and we consider the entire ground manifold, our Hamiltonian is the natural part, the hyperfine interaction between the nuclear spin and the electron spin. There's no orbital angle on momentum in the ground state of the alkalis. And then there's a part that is associated with the interaction between our applied magnetic field and the magnetic moment of the electron, and then the applied magnetic field and the magnetic moment of the nucleus. And so what we uh, can do is we can put on first a large bias field that raises the degeneracy between these levels in each manifold. I've exaggerated the splitting is about a megahertz, and this splitting is about 9 gigahertz. Uh, once we've done that, we can put on an RF magnetic field that couples these levels. I can't just couple two of them, right, because all these transitions are degenerate or close to. Uh, so if I couple two, I couple all of them. But if I write up my uh, Hamiltonian for the radio frequency fields, I can go into a, I can do a rotating wave approximation just as I can do for a two level system. And then it turns out that for each of these manifolds in the rotating frame, this RF field just does rotations again. And then I can couple these two with microwaves like we talked about throughout the previous lecture. Turns out that this makes the system I was talking about, you can go through the procedure that we described at the beginning and you can find that in principle you, you have that you can make enough different Hamiltonians of this type by changing your magnetic field around to uh, make the system completely controllable. Uh, and this is discussed in uh, various papers and also this uh, PhD thesis that, that came out lately uh, in all its uh, full gory detail. This Hamiltonian looks simple, but once you've made rotating wave approximations, it it takes up a whole page. Uh, but that's not really important here. Uh, it turns out that the handles that you have on this are things like the Rabi frequency for the microwave transition. You, want it to, you can set it to be resonant, but then you can also change the phase of the microwave drive. And similarly for these RF fields, we apply an RF field along X and one along Y, and we have Rabi frequencies or Lama frequencies in the rotating frame, and we have phases. And it turns out you don't actually need to play around with the time dependence of the Rabi frequencies. You can just play around with the time dependence of the phases, just as we could do when we were just controlling this qubit alone. So that's nifty, because phases is something that is very easy to change very fast. Diagnostics. As you correctly pointed out, there is this chicken and egg problem with uh, state control and tomography. I think no, I still it's just that my back is giving me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were telling me to, to wrap no, up. I think I have another 15 minutes or no, so. No, no, don't worry. It's okay. Up and down or okay. I mean, I'm actually hoping I can let out people a little early. <laughs> uh, but as you, as, as you pointed out, this is a chicken and egg problem. And in any case, the tomography that I just told you about uh, was only about 90% accurate. It, it just won't do, uh, do the job here. 
So what we did instead was that we restricted ourselves to measuring the fidelity of maps from one of these magnetic sublevels to, to another one, at least to start with. Okay, and the way we do that is basically a Stern Gerlach measurement. Right? So you take these atoms that are laser cool, so that if you release them, they just fall like stones. And uh, you apply a fairly strong magnetic field gradient so that there's a spin dependent force, so that some spin states get pushed down, some other spin states get held back. If you measure the arrival time down here, what you will see is that all the different magnetic sublevels arrive at different times. The detector here is made out of resonant laser light, so you can tell apart f equals 3 and f equals 4 as well. Yeah? Is it possible to do state selective open precipitation using the splittings between the uh, It's very hard to do that so you can measure the magnetic sublevel. Right, because uh, then you would have to uh, have Zeeman shifts somehow involved that are lar larger than an optical line with about 5 megahertz in this case. Right. But when you have cold atoms, this separation in time is very easy to achieve. Right. I mean, you can see that these uh, arrival peaks here are beautifully separated. And if you pick one of them, these are actually, what we typically do is if we prepare the atoms in this state here, and then we can map to one of the others using one of our control waveforms. And if, for example, you look here where we've made, let's say, m equals 1, I deliberately picked some early ones that weren't that good. You can see that there are all sorts of little wiggles here, which are population that's left over in some of the other states. So you can just fit this, and you can see how large a percentage of the total signal is in the target peak, and how much of it is in the others. And you can get fidelity out of this. Yeah? So it seems like you can resolve different states in f equals 4 manifold, but how about different states in f equals 4 and f equals 3? Yeah, so what we do is, uh, this detector here can be, it's basically a light beam, and we measure fluorescence as the atoms fall through. And so if the light is tuned to a transition that starts out of f equals 3, we see atoms in f equals 3. If it's tuned to a transition that starts out of f equals 4, we see light in f equals 4. And then we just have to do it a couple of times for different choices of, of the light frequency. To build up statistics. Okay. So here is an example, a map that takes us from our initial state that we can prepare by optical pumping into some final state. And just as for the qubits, you know, it's some sequence of phase steps, and there's no real way of looking at this and saying, oh yeah, it's clear what happens, why they must look like that. This is something the computer spit out. But we can run lots of these kinds of waveforms mapping us to the 16 different magnetic sublevels. We can measure the fraction that made it into the right state, which is the fidelity. We can average that. Right? We can see here we get an average fidelity that's about 96%. And this is done in about 150 microseconds of, of, of uh, uh, driving these microwaves which you can compare. Now our measured coherence time is something like 30 milliseconds, and that's mostly due to background magnetic field noise, which is about 200 times the mapping time. So now we really have a lot of room to do interesting coherent dynamics. Really, there's only what we call inhomogeneous errors. That is, the different driving fields are maybe not quite what they should be. Maybe they vary inhomogeneously over the cloud of atoms or something like that. There is no decoherence because there is no light. Everything is kept in the atomic ground state all the time. So this is a system where we can really hope to play around with these ideas of doing robust control. Though very little is actually known about how to do that beyond spin one half. I don't know of anybody who has really tried to play around with it in issue 16 rather than issue 2. Uh, th there's been a little bit of work done, but really we were being sort of quite pragmatic about it. Let's just try and see if we can get it to work. So here's what we decided to do. Uh, after looking at our experiment carefully, we decided that the real problem was that these RF fields that we were applying, the megahertz RF fields to do transitions inside each, inside each manifold, the RF power was not completely homogeneous over the cloud. And also, somehow the RF detuning would not be quite homogeneous. And that was really because the bias field was not quite homogeneous. So uh, 
the transition frequency for the different atoms was not quite, quite homogeneous. But in any case, what we did was we, when we, when we did this calculation of what the fidelity was in order to be able to optimize it, well, what we did was we said let's calculate it for four different values of the RF Rabi frequency and the RF detuning where the perfect value is in here. Let's instead ca calculate it at plus minus 2% for each of them and then average over those two, those, those four points. Right? So the, each of these represent a case where something went wrong. And we just asked the computer program to optimize so that your average works as well as possible in these four spots that are off from the ideal. And that turned out to work really well in theory that this should produce uh, easily state maps with fidelities of 99.9%. In theory, it increased the average fidelity by a percent. In practice, I mean in the experiment. So, we were somewhat disappointed by that. Uh, so I, I, have, I yeah. have a question. If you look uh, on the left side and, and you look at the 93% fidelity and the 95% or 97, that's the 98, the best. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at your pulse sequence, right, can you see something in the pulse sequence which tells you this is not as good just by looking at it? No, okay. no, no. I. I We've never been able to look at one of those things. Oh, you get too close to the end. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and we, we haven't even tried okay. to, under, to, to try to correlate the pulse sequence with, with what we get out. Okay. okay, so this increase here, as I said, this was quite disappointing, and it was all, also much less than we had expected to see. So what's going on here? Well, what's going on is that when we measure how many, how big a fraction of the atoms made it, it into the correct final state, there are two errors there that we that doesn't really have anything to do with our control. The first error is how many atoms started in the right state. Okay, optical pumping is not perfect. And the second is what about any error that crept into our measurement of the spin populations at the end. You know, clearly those are areas that we would like to separate out. Because that has nothing to do with how well we do our control. And so the solution to that is a very clever one that, that we didn't come up with. Uh, it's something, it's a, it, it, it's a variation of something called random benchmarking that Emmanuel Knill at uh, NIST came up with to uh, test how well quantum gates work. And the idea is, we start in this state that we can make, we can also measure it, measure how many atoms are in it at the end, this is the other analysis. So we map from that to some intermediate state and back and measure how well we did it. We can also map from 4-4 into a state and into another state and into 4-4. <coughs> and from 4-4 into one state, second state, first state, second state, and so on, through many intermediate states. This first step here, we think of as our initialization error. There's an error here that has nothing to do with these successive maps in here. And similarly, the last map and readout of this population, we call that a readout error. Okay? So now the idea is, we measure the fidelity with which we return to this state here as a function of how many intermediate steps we have from zero to some maximum number. And then we have to average over many sequences of different randomly chosen intermediate states. So we just design state maps that take us from 4-4 into some random first state, into some random second state, and so on, into some random last state, and then from that back into 4-4. And then we plot this average fidelity as a function of n, and fit it to some complicated function. Uh, let's just first take a look at what happens. Okay? So when you do these successive maps, each step of the map reduces the fidelity by a constant factor, it just drops, right? And if you look at this fit function down here, what do we have here? Well, we have, in the overall fidelity, we have something that goes as the fidelity of each map to the power n, or a fidelity of a randomly chosen map, I should say, to the power n. This is sort of an average state. This epsilon is an average error per state map. And then there's a factor here 
which is to combine the error infidelity associated with initialization and readout. What about this stuff here? Well, this first factor here is uh, basically because if you prepare a completely random state, then its fidelity with any particular state will be 1 16th. That's the overlap between two random states. So this decay here must level out at 1 over 16. And uh, since it has to start at 1 and end at 1 over 16, the prefactor here has to be 15 over 16. So basically, we have a good fit, fit function. And, and what we can see is our robust waveforms uh, decay, decay as a function of the number of the overall fidelity decayed as a function of number of intermediate steps in a way that corresponded now to an average fidelity per state map of 99.1%. So that's a factor of 10 better than the first experiment. If we don't do these robust tricks, we get about 98%. Yeah? Why is it at 98% uh, for zero transformations or for zero state maps? That's because it still includes initialization and readout error. Right. This, this is the fidelity we measure, the overall one that includes in initializing, stepping through the intermediate states, going back to the final one and measuring it. Okay, and, and here is the uh, original paper, the original idea for doing this by Manuel Knell uh, from a number of years ago. So you can see this uh, relieves us from having to rely on quantum state tomography. It also relieves us from having to just look at the magnetic sublevels themselves because these intermediate states can be chosen completely randomly and indeed we did so. These were state maps between completely randomly chosen uh, superpositions of all 16 ground states. So this really tells us in a statistical sense uh, something meaningful about how well we do. Okay, uh, so I think that I'm going to call it quits here. Uh, I will sum this up. Uh, well, having to sum this up reminds me of uh, a visit I had by a staff member from our local science community, uh, science museum, uh, a bit more than a year ago when they were preparing an exhibit for uh, LaserFest uh, 2011 to commemorate uh, the anniversary of the, of the laser. And he came to me, he had heard I used lasers in my research, and he wanted to know what I was doing. And I talked to him for about half an hour about this kind of stuff. And I, I could see that he wasn't really getting excited about that, uh, which was perhaps not very strange. Uh, I don't think he had a background in atomic physics. Uh, so after a while, he got tired, and he said, if you had to explain this in a way that a young child and your grandmother could understand, what would you say? And uh, I thought about that for quite a while. I mean, it's something we often imagine that we have to do, but it's hard to come up with inspiration. But I ended up saying to him this, we make Adam's dance. And he's, he just lit up at that. He really liked that. But in the end, we never came up with an exhibit that uh, <laughs> had anything to do with this. But for us, who are uh, atomic physicists, of course, the take-home message is hopefully one that this idea of doing quantum control and thinking of it as a science in its own right uh, with that, we can put together quite a powerful toolbox that can be used with AMO science. So one could, for example, envision what I just talked about now, this idea of making robust control of d-dimensional systems. You could build, you could extend that, presumably, to something like what we did with the qubits, where you spatially control what state you're making. Right? So you could imagine in with a Bose-Einstein condensate in an optical lattice, an ability to go in and prepare different regions of that BEC in, random, in, in arbitrary states that you would choose. I'm not an expert in that field, but it seems to me that that could be an interesting starting point for studying non-equilibrium dynamics as well. You wouldn't have to limit yourself to two-level system. You would look at, at, at larger spins uh, and go presumably way beyond the kind of physics that you would see in uh, in, in a condensed matter system. So with that, uh, let me finish. What, what did the toolbox say? Hamilton mm -hmm. inside. Yeah. I copied that from Ivan, but apparently I lost contrast that? in the process. Can you guys read that? I can. I, can. <laughs> <laughs> I can't either, actually. <laughs> it shows up on my screen, but. Uh, Just okay. Clear.
I'll pin that on Ivan because I copied that off, off one of these slides. <laughs> yeah. Well, kind of, kind of, uh, so. uh -huh. No, I don't, I don't think it's just because of that, actually. It was important to oh, yes. Anyway, just that. Uh, thank you also to the people who, who did the work. This is my current group here, and who talked, I think, those of you who visited, uh, met many of these guys, and also past students who worked on the first version of the, of the control experiment. Yeah. I'll finish here. Thank you.